Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all, your smiling faces, and good morning to everyone on Facebook and probably tomorrow and onward on YouTube. We're glad to have you. I'm Eric Loudermilk, and I serve as the interim pastor here at Oasis at Conway Gardens, and we're really, really glad to have you. If you're a guest with us live or in person, take out your phone or your computer and go to www.oasisconwaygardens.org. Click on I'm New and register your visit with us. A couple of announcements before we get started. On October 16th, right here, on Saturday, October 16th, from 11 to 1, we're going to have hoops and hot dogs, a basketball uh, event for our community. Please invite your friends. On October 30th, also a Saturday, from 4 to 6 p.m., we're going to have our traditional annual trunk or treat. And we are cooperating with Cross Point Downtown, who meets here in the morning, and Cross Point Espanol, who's meeting simultaneously right now in our fellowship hall. Our job for that event is to bring candy and to host the game. So you can bring candy and put it in the box for the food pantry in the hall. And we'll know what it's for. If you'd like to volunteer to run a game for us, see Stephanie after service. Finally, uh, this uh, next week will be the last uh, Sunday in our series on marriage. We'll be starting a new series uh, the second week in October for skeptics. So if you know people who have a difficult time with faith, that's the time to invite them. Or if you have questions, that's the time to come. And then in November, God willing, I'm praying and planning on doing a series on finances for us all. So that's what's coming up. Let's get started. This song, let's all stand as we sing God So Loved, just dwelling on the love of God this morning. One, two, three, four. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. So love the world. 
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Jeremy. Let's open in prayer. God, thank you again for our family, for these that are gathered with us today. We ask you to be with us today as we worship you and learn more about communication in marriage. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys ready to play a game? We're going to play Family Feud. I need my players to come forward, my willing victims. Three guys. This is Jama, Aracellus. Did I say it right, Aracellus? And this is uh, Jackie Ortiz. This is Ron Jaffe. Everyone knows James. And then I don't know who this guy is on the end. So, so I'm gonna to start this. I'm gonna read a little paragraph. Then I'll read the question. You ready? So I'll tell you when I'm gonna read the question. A 1984 research study reported in the Journal of Human Communication Research involved 33 married couples. Each partner was given a list of 10 issues important in marriage. What's important in marriage? Love. Love. Commitment. What's important in marriage? Communication. Taking out the trash. <laughs> Each partner had to describe how they felt their spouse felt on each issue. So you had to write down what you thought Pat thought. And then you had to record what you yourselves thought about the issue. Okay. So these 33 couples wrote down what they thought their spouse felt or believed about each issue and then what they believed. Question number one. According to this study, what information did spouses use most often to inform themselves about their partners? What information did they use most often to inform themselves about their partners? Ron. Their mouth. <laughs> Jama. No, you got a ring. You got an idea? Okay. Um, communication. How's that? Okay. You can consort with your team and try to come up with an answer. You can consort with your team and try to come up with an answer. Is it working now? Okay, Ron, what's your answer? Social media. Little notes. Okay, what's the number one answer? Are you going to show them all four, all three at once? Okay, go ahead. This is going to shock you. Couples used their own feelings on the issue. In other words, they projected their feelings about the issue when they wrote down what their partners thought. The second was nonverbals and extraverbals. They learn the most from the partner, not from what the partner said, but when the partner used nonverbals or raised their voice. That's really great news, isn't it, for a marriage? The third was the partner's own verbal information they shared, third in the list, and the last was stereotypes about the genders. All right, question number two. All right, we need to switch lead persons. Lead persons. Let's talk. Got us. Don't you supposed to clap it up and all? Okay, all right. All right, yeah, 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 yeah. Question number two. What percentage... You're cheating. Get that hand up. Oh, there you go. There you go. What percentage of the time did wives think they were on the same page with their husbands? Arcellus. 40%. You can try to steal. Uh, Ring your bell. He's got a bad phone. Okay, go ahead. Um... 90. Correct answer? 68% of the time, wives thought they were on the same page with their, with their same issue. All right, next partners. Switch. Okay, let's see if we can get... We have two questions left. Can we get one answer right? No, Just one answer? Okay. We're on the same page. Same question, reversed roles. What percentage of the time did husbands think they were on the same page with their wives? 15%. Good answer. Uh, Jackie. Um, 70%. Yeah. Yeah. You're within, she was within 5%. 75% of the time, husbands thought, yeah, I know what my wife thinks. Yeah. All right. Really? This team won. This team, goose egg. One more switch here. Switch right. players. Okay. This time, husbands and wives are grouped together. 
supposed to be ready in season and out of season. Sorry, right? Ready? Come on, Ron. You're I'm the shaking, tech guy. I'm shaking. There you go. What percentage of the time did husbands and wives actually understand each other? Game up. 25. Ron. 10. Correct answer. 19% of the time. Thank you for playing. Thank you for playing. Give them a hand. I think we need to talk about communication this morning. <clears throat> 68 to 75% of the time, partners thought they knew what their partner was thinking on an issue. Issues range from household chores to what to do with their leisure time to how well they communicated. But only 19% of the time did they really, really know what the other was thinking. Fascinating study. All right, you should have a handout, and Jack has those, and I don't think we got them passed out in service. So, Jack, if you and your team, one of the, Joe and Sam, can you help him out? And let's get these passed out. We're, um, I'm going to start my timer, because if I don't start my timer, we'll get out at three instead of two. All righty. Communication. Today we're talking about communication in marriage. Now, as I said, this is the next to the last message in this series. Uh, the last message will be on intimacy. And I wish we had more time to deal with other topics. Um, so I want you to keep two things in mind about marriage that I'm not going to preach on. One is that love is a choice. It's, it, it comes with feelings in the beginning, and if you do it right, often those feelings resurface. But young people, the feelings will go away. And then you choose to act on those feelings, and they come back. The second thing is that finances is a major stressor in marriage, and that's one of the reasons we'll deal with finances in November, God willing. So we're talking about communication. We have three or four points. I'm going to go through the first one quickly, and then we're going to move on to the second, which is the meaty point. Number one, why is communication so important in marriage? Why is communication so important in marriage? First, because we are made in the image of God as communicators. On your handout. We are made in the image of God as communicators. You see, God authored all of the Bible. 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, and each of those prophets, preachers, and letter writers are writing, they're communicating on behalf of God. And secondly, when God creates, he does it by speaking, by communicating. Genesis 1.27 says that we are made in the image of God. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we're, we're communicators because he is a communicator and we're made in his image. Secondly, under the why, this is your letter B on your handout. Since we are indeed male and female, since we are male and female, we are different and need to communicate those differences. Since we are male and female, we are different and need to communicate those differences. Now, if we had two hours today, we would tell some stories to elucidate this, and you all have stories. But I think our research and our game show makes that clear. So let's keep moving. Letter C. Ever since humanity fell into delusion, I like to use other words other than sin. Now, preacher, don't you believe in sin? Yes, I do. But there are words that have become obstacles, and I'm trying to use new words that say the same thing. We think we know better than God. So when we fell in Genesis 3, that was a delusion. Ever since humanity fell into delusion in Genesis 3, we became numb skulls. N-U-M... And the old spelling adds a B next. N-U-M-B-S-K-U-L-L-S. -L -L We're numb in the brain. We became numb skulls, and our ability to communicate has gone completely haywire. You agree, Jeremy? Ever since humanity fell into the delusion in Genesis 3 and became numb skulls, our ability to communicate has gone completely haywire. We talked about this last week, but... Reading parts of Genesis 3, 14, and 16, we read, The Lord God said, Because you have done this, to the wife, he says, Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he will rule over you. Jackie, come up here a moment. Would you mind? Now, I'm not picking on Jackie. We rehearsed this. <coughs> we talked about the 
I am picking on her, but I asked her beforehand if I can pick on her. Because of sin, it's the husband's sinful tendency to rule his wife, and it's the wife's tendency to buck that. She has every right to have, I mean, if she's going to be sinful, that's what she's going to need to do. Right, Jackie? What's the matter with you? Let me rule you. Come on, girl. Thank you. I mean, when you're this bad of a preacher, you've got to try something, right? Wives, you ever feel like that? In your spirit? Let me hear it. Do you ever feel like that? Yeah, I know Patty's felt like that. Number two. So I told you we'd go through number one quickly. Here's where we get into some interesting stuff. The goal of communication, now we're on number two, the goal. The goal of communication is to correct <clears throat> Excuse me. my understanding of my spouse so I can change my behavior and serve him or her better. The goal of communication is to correct my misunderstandings of my spouse so I can change my behavior and serve him or her better. Now, as if you want a, a little eye-opener, as I was studying yesterday, this was an eye-opening moment for me. Because as a male, what do you think I want to do in communication? Well, the second half of this point describes it. This is not on your handout. As opposed to communicating to my spouse what's wrong with her or him so that I can get him or her to change. The goal of communication is to correct my misunderstanding of my spouse so that I can change my behavior and serve him or her better. As opposed to communicating to my spouse what's wrong with her or him so that I can get him or her to change. The goal here is to change me, to change my information so I can serve her. Remember the research in the game, partners strongly overestimated the similarity between what they thought about an issue and what they thought their partners felt about that issue. <coughs> For husbands, they scored 75% of the time. They scored themselves as 75% of the time, yeah, I'm, I'm on the same page with my wife on finance. Yeah, I'm on the same page with my wife on intimacy. Not. And wives scored themselves as 68% of the time. Yeah, I'm on the same page with my husband about our communication styles. We're on the same page 68% of the time about how we spend our leisure time or how we deal with the kids. But in reality, when researchers then took the, the questionnaires and read what the husbands and wives each thought about each other, so let's say Chuck and Darlene did this survey, and they were the 68 and 75, they had another questionnaire that said, I, Darlene, this is what I think about how we spend our leisure time. And Chuck writes, this is what he thinks about his leisure time. Only 19% of the time we're on the same page. Darlene wants to plant flowers, and Chuck and I are off at uh, the New Smyrna Raceway, right? That's how we spend our leisure time. So we need to communicate. We need to correct our misunderstanding of each other. Another way to look at that last percentage Instead of 19% of the time we agree, what it means is that 81% of the time in this group of survey couples, we're on the same page, or we're on the wrong page. And these are those who completed the survey. There were two who didn't respond to the research request. Nine more said they would, but didn't finish. And why do you think they didn't finish? They had to record themselves discussing these issues. I don't think a lot of couples want to. I think these are the couples who did better than others. So this actually helps me. When I communicate with Patty, when you communicate with your spouse, this helps us see that she or he is not on the same page as I am. That means then, in communication with your spouse, you're going to have to accept that you're going to hear some negative things. Guys, how does it make you feel when your spouse doesn't understand you? Ron, how does that make you feel? Not great, right? Ladies? Now, Carol, your husband has gone on to be with the Lord, so we can pick on you. How did it make you feel when he didn't get you? Frustrating. And how do we express frustration? With negative comments. This is how I feel. This isn't right. And sometimes with emotion. So that means we're going to have to be okay hearing some negative emotions. In fact, the research showed that couples with satisfied and happy marriages 
that the partners understood each other more when they felt comfortable enough to share this information. If I flip that around and state it this way, it's that satisfied marriage partners were those who engaged in conflict and shared negative feelings with each other. And it, they felt better understood by their partners. They were on the same page. There is a business team-building author named Patrick Lencioni. He's one of the most famous authors in the business world on getting teams to work together. And he says that the lack of trust in a team means the avoidance of sharing feelings and holding each other accountable. So if you're not communicating with each other, you surely don't trust each other, which means there's no way you're going to tell him or her how you feel. Because that means being vulnerable. Thus, we need to communicate and grow in trust in marriage, even though and because we don't understand each other. We don't understand each other. Patty's getting ready to fly back from Tennessee. I think I heard an amen. 1 Peter 3, 7. I'm going to read this in a couple of translations. If you have your Bibles, turn there. 1 Peter 3, 7. You have time because I'm going to read it a couple of different ways. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Here is a translation done by a scholars group, more for scholars. It's called the Lexham English Bible. Husbands, in the same way, Live with your wives knowledgeably. Knowledgeably. Did I pronounce that right? Knowledgeably. Live with your wives knowledgeably as the weaker female vessel, showing them honor. How can you honor her if you don't know her? And you don't know her according to the research, even when you think you do. Now, if you think the goal of communication is to tell your spouse your opinion of what's wrong with them, there is a word in Scripture found for this. It's called fool. And it describes probably 75% of my communication. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. And you know what, fellas? Feeling, quote, we're on the same page matters most in the wife's satisfaction in marriage. Feeling we're on the same page matters most to the female. Now, this was a controlled study. They actually did the study twice. They did it with 33 couples, gathered their data. At the same time, they were doing it with another set of 40 couples to make sure the findings were correct. And they found that when things weren't great, especially in communication, it bothered the wife more. It bothered the wife more. Why is that? Well, first off, because she's less empowered. And by that, I'll point out two ways she's less empowered. I think I could have taken Jackie. I think I could. Now, I'm not going to go after any of those Olympic female weightlifters. But typically, scientifically, we know that men are physically stronger, though uglier, than women. And that's not fair in marriage. So she feels less empowered. And secondly, in our culture, at least, and in many cultures, the wife feels less empowered. Because when they get married, more often than not, she leaves her job. More often than not, she stays home. And he's out getting fulfillment in his career. Thirdly, she's more relationally geared. Did you know, fellas, sorry to tell you this, Dean, but at six months in the womb, the male embryo has a surge of hormones which fries out half its neural net. At six months in the womb, the male embryo has a surge of hormones which fries out half its neural net. Darlene, did you know Chuck was operating with half a brain? That's why we miss out on so much. We don't get it. We are numbskulls. So when we're not on the same page, we're clueless. But it, she carries it all day long. And the last reason she carries it heavier is because 
he is geared to derive more of his meaning and purpose in life from his job and career. Where are women designed to, de to derive their meaning and purpose in life? From their family and relationships. So when we're off preparing sermons, and, and guys, I do it too. I mean, I, I, I'm an I'm a oxymoron. Some of my colleagues and friends have said, you're the only guy we know who could be running a chainsaw and then looking up Greek words in the same day. Um, so I get blue-collar work. I love work. But my biggest problem is I'll be on the computer all day long, and Patty says, you're not even here. Because I get meaning from that. But she needs meaning from our relationship. She needs meaning from our relationship with our children. So remember, happy wife, happy life. In fact, the research confirms that not only is the wife the one who carries that the most, but three studies confirm that the wife's perceptions of how good they're doing is an indicator of overall marital satisfaction. If mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. If you want your marriage to be happy, get on the same page with your wife. Three research studies confirm that. But remember, you're not here to change your spouse. Wives, you're not here to change your husbands. Husbands, you're not here to change her. You are here to correct your misunderstanding of your spouse that 19% of the time, and to change your behavior and serve him or her better. You ever heard of the bombshell theory? Let's throw this up. The bombshell theory is used in substance abuse treatment programs for families when one partner is addicted to something and it's causing the whole family problems. And what do they tell each member of the family? Number one, I cannot change another person by direct action. You cannot do it. <clears throat> when I first started going to counseling, I've lost track how many decades ago this was. I'm good friends with this counselor. This was a lay counselor. And I, she said, what are you here for? I said, well, my wife thinks, she thinks I might be controlling. And I think she might be a little right. And my dear friend said, no, I can't believe that of you. But I was frustrated with her, and I was there to change her. And guess what? My shrink did not work on her. My shrink worked on me, and she taught me this theory. You cannot change another person by direct action. Number two, I can only change myself by God's grace. I can only change myself by God's grace. Thirdly, others may, and that may is important. Because even though God has typically created human beings in certain ways, and the genders do act in certain ways. There are exceptions to these. And there's no guarantee that if you change, your spouse will change. It is likely that you're, up, you're responsible for you. Others may change. Others may have a tendency to change in reaction to my change. The bombshell theory. Memorize it and work on yourself. Number three, communication is a skill set. Communication is a skill set. Communication is a skill set that is developed over time. It's not like, oh, let's go on a date. We've communicated. We're done. In fact, that's been my theory of communication in my marriage for decades. We need to communicate. Okay, we're done. No, it is a skill set that is developed over time and involves a shared set of rules, boundaries, that a couple develops together. It involves a shared set of rules or boundaries that a couple develops together. Did you guys get all that? If I'm playing Monopoly, I can't roll a two and skip four spaces. That's against the rules of the game. Now, if you've played Monopoly enough, or if you grow up in our culture, you don't start the game by going, okay, when I roll a two, I can only take two, and Jeremy, when you roll a five, don't take eight steps. You know those. How do you know those? Because you've played board games. So I'm not talking about setting down and writing out rules for your communication skills, your styles. That comes way later. The rules will evolve. And here's where, I don't know if we have any Italians in the, in the, in the congregation, Carol. I'm going to stereotype Cal, uh, Italians and redheads. Your rules may be different. 
Your culture may be used to more volume in an argument. And other cultures, my wife's culture, it's not that way. And I'm not telling you that, that volume is always wrong. It might be okay in your culture. We have a friend of a friend that their marriage eventually fell apart because one of them argued loudly and it was their family's way and the other just couldn't handle it. So communication is a skill set that is developed over time and involves a shared set of rules or boundaries that a couple develops together. And I'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. In other words, there's a right and wrong way to do it, and it takes a lot of practice to develop it as a couple. James 3.6, the tongue is a fire. The tongue represents the world of wrongdoing among the parts of our bodies. It pollutes the entire body and sets fire to the course of human existence and is set on fire by hell. That's the wrong way to do it. You've got to learn to do it the right way. Chaplain, professor, and pastor, Dr. Gregory Brown says, while dating couples often spend as much time as possible with one another, sadly in marriage, quality time starts to fade. The husband has work. The wife is typically caring for the house and children and possibly working as well. As the children get older, the husband and wife spend more time focusing on the children and less time on each other. As this rhythm continues, they eventually get to the point where they no longer know one another at all. Those two individuals change every day and continue to grow to one another differently. So they must make time for one another. This can include yearly couple retreats. Yes, I said yearly. Weekly date nights. Daily times of intimate communication. My wife and I, he says... Try to spend at least the last hour of every day without TV or computer on. By doing this, we aim to get to know each other better. <coughs> when I was at my lowest in my doctoral dissertation, we tried to spend every Sunday night together. We did not hit that goal, but by having that goal, we got close to it. We knew we had to keep dating in the toughest of times. Now... Our best time is walking together, but uh, we don't always do that. So let's talk a moment about time. It needs to be dedicated and repeated. The time you spend with your wife, spouse to communicate needs to be dedicated and communicated. I came in dedicated and repeated, excuse me. I came into my office one time when I was at the West Palm Beach campus, and back then I handled student discipline issues, which tended to make people angry. Parents got angry, students got angry, parents, students lied to parents, parent called the president, and then the president and the vice president were angry. I literally came into the office one day, and my assistant, Jill, comes to me, and I don't remember all the figures, but I remember the provost, who's the second in command of the university. The provost is on line one. The vice president is on line two. There's three students waiting to see me and two parents. In 30 seconds, eight people wanted me right then. Right then. How many could I talk to? One. And it was kind of neat because there were so many I knew I couldn't do it. If I was two, I'd probably, like a numbskull, try it. So I calmly said, I'll take the provost. He's the most powerful. You've got to dedicate time to your spouse. You've got to take time away. You know, the, we said in the first sermon that a marriage is sacred. That's just a later term. I think it's a Latin term for the biblical term, Holy. A marriage is holy. And the Old Testament term for holy is, is, is it's kodesh. Not that you need it, kodesh. But the meaning of that term is twofold. You separate yourself from one thing and you dedicate yourself to something else. So when the Israelites had to sanctify or holy themselves, they would separate themselves from common things and then dedicate themselves to the temple or the holy task at hand. Your marriage is sacred, and you've got to separate yourselves from the voices around you and dedicate yourself to time and the voice of your spouse. And in truth, the more people in your household, the more difficult and important this is. The more difficult and important this is. Now let's talk about truth in communication. <clears throat> All these are subpoints of point three, and I don't think they're on your handout. Truth. Share the truth, even if it's painful. 
Share the truth, even if it's painful. Ephesians 4, 15, Paul says, rather speaking the truth in love. Rather speaking the truth in love. Now this is where it gets hard. We could spend a day on this. There's so many tricks and techniques. One of them is to use I statements. When you come home late and don't tell me, I feel neglected. I feel like you don't care. When you don't talk to me, I feel like you hate me. Now, sometimes you need to do this with a coach. And honestly, I don't think I'm great at this. We've done it with coaches before. Rather than using you statements, you came home from work late and you don't care for me, you didn't call. Switch it to I. When you do this, I feel this way. But you too are a fool if you deliver those feelings, giving full vent to your emotion and anger. Proverbs 29, 11, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. That spouse is going to give you negative emotion. You need to be ready for it, but you also both need to be regulatory in that and use restraint. Sometimes that means waiting a day or two. When I was young, I had to settle it that night. Not letting the anger, the sun go down in your wrath doesn't mean you fix it that night. You, it means you say, I'm an idiot. The problem is when you're 20, you don't know you're an idiot. When you're 56, you're sick of realizing you're an idiot. I'm an idiot. I'm going to lay this aside. I'm going to do something to distract myself. And go to bed and deal with it later. I went to dinner with my daughter and, and husband Wednesday night. They flew in from Tennessee. And because of a series of events, three things went wrong about it. And I'm trying, desperate to lose weight. So I hadn't eaten in a couple hours. And I had to drive all the way down here. And it turns out we weren't eating alone. I was mad as a hornet. And I prayed and prayed. I finally turned on a racing podcast. Why? To distract myself. Put it aside. And when I saw my daughter and her husband, I was no longer angry. Sometimes simple things as distracting yourself. So the sun doesn't go down on your wrath. Do we disagree? Yes, but I'm not wrathful anymore. Choose when to give those emotions. Practice the rested and fed rule. Feed that partner. Make sure they're rested and then tell them. Our most important date in our, in our, our married history. I took her to date. I prayed over it a week. I fed her and then we talked. And she said, where are the divorce papers so that I can sign them? That's not funny, but she didn't do that. <clears throat> What about listening? What do we say about listening? Listen, listen, listen. Proverbs 18, 13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. And when you hear that angry complaint, be quick to listen and slow to anger. James 1, 13. You've heard the old saying, God gave us two ears and one mouth. There's a reason for that. So we listen twice as much as we talk. Now let's go back to the gender differences. Guys, you've got to be gentle. This is where I stand in the office of pastor and not in the person of Eric because I have failed this so many times. Guys, you've got to be gentle. Dr. Brown states again, Peter calls wives the weaker partner or weaker vessel. People just, they just flip out over this. Well, very simply, it first off means she's a weaker physically person. I think I can take Jackie. I think I can. No, she says I can't. But it may mean more than that, that she's delicate and gentle. And because the woman is more delicate and gentle than the man, he is more prone to hurt her physically, emotionally, and verbally. And for this reason, Paul commanded the husbands not to be harsh with their wives. And Peter calls for husbands to be knowledgeable of their wives and considerate of them as the weaker vessels. Now, ladies, though we're beating up on the guys, you have a job in this too. Certainly, you must follow these commandments as well. You've got to be considerate of his style. Don't hit him when he comes in. You know, feed that boy. And then go, baby, we need to talk about something. And then if you can turn on the cry button, it works so good. 
Start, now here's a very, very simple but great tip. Start with easy, concrete tasks. Tangible issues. The study had ten issues, and they said the issues that were concrete and tangible were easier for couples to deal with. And as you build up your communication habits, then you can move on to more difficult topics, like household tasks. I was floored when a counselor said to Patty and I, Patty, what's one thing you can tell Eric that he could do to help you? You understand him better and him serve you. And Patty, what's Eric, what's one thing she can do? I don't have a clue what I told her, but she said, when you get ready for bed at night, please don't leave your clothes on the floor. We saw a counselor for that. We paid 100 bucks for this. you got to be kidding me. I was shocked that that mattered so much to her. I was shocked that she didn't feel safe to tell me that, uncoached. Now, do you, do, ladies, do you know why I leave my clothes right there on the floor? Do any of the guys know? That's exactly right. That's how a man thinks. If someone starts to break into my home, I'm not taking him down in my skivvies. <laughs> not happening. So now we reach the compromise. I lay them on a dresser, and I should fold them, but I don't. Every night, I still, I don't put my clothes in a hamper for that reason. That's because I'm geared to protect and to protect fully clothed. She's geared for beauty and, and order. And only through communication do we do that. But my point here was start with those simple things. You'll be shocked at what she needs you to do. Ladies, you'll be shocked on, on why he does that. Another simple thing to talk about is career or home pressures. Tell me how it feels to be at home all day. Tell me how it feels to deal with those rocket scientists all day, Pat. Another easy topic, and these are on the back of your sheet, some of these easy ones. How should we spend our leisure time? In fact, this is really difficult. You want to go to a movie? I don't know. You want to go to a movie? You go out to eat? I don't know. We do that all day long. But at least it's concrete and tangible. And sitting down in a controlled time to do that is important. And the last concrete issue that maybe is a little tougher is finances. That never ends. Later on, when you feel you're better at communicating, you can work on your actual communication skills, boundaries your affection and intimacy life, irritability and criticism. All right, let's wrap this up. A couple more tips and then we'll be done. I want you to rep recognize reciprocity in difficult dialogue. I want you to recognize reciprocity in difficult dialogue. Proverbs 15, 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh answer stirs up anger. Now, it took three researchers of three major universities and 73 couples to figure this out. But what they found out is when these partners were in dialogue and they analyzed the tapes, a soft answer from one spouse generated a soft response. A positive answer from one spouse generated a positive response. A negative answer generated a negative response. Now that's where you got to be careful. If you're giving your spouse permission to tell you something negative, you should plan ahead. Take a walk and imagine... Uh, Lucy or Judy or, or Sam saying, I don't like it when you do this. And you go, thank you for telling me that. Because your reaction is going to be to give a negative response. And a neutral answer generated a neutral response. Those are tips. Take time. Expect those things. Finally, as the band comes, unfortunately, there are some outliers. There are some special situations. Certain situations make communication and satisfaction in marriage much more difficult and often requires not only prayer and humility, but outside help such as a professional counselor. The following curveballs are special situations in marriage that I think require really hard work, more patience and grace, continued prayer and outside assistance. Situation number one, if your name is Ron, Uh, number one, mental health or dysfunctional behavior in a household. If you have someone who's physically or mentally disabled, that adds another factor. Number two, death of a parent. Number three, very large household. 
I'm showing a video to many of my friends of a pastor in Africa. They have six biological children and seven more they've taken into their home. They have a household of 14 children, people. They have to work hard on their marriage. Infidelity. Yes, it is possible in some cases to move past infidelity, but you'll need outside help. The death or a suicide of a child. Chronic or acute illness or sickness. Got a pandemic, anyone? Or a completely uncooperative spouse. If you have those situations or you're having an especially difficult time, realize you're going to have to be more patient, more graceful with your spouse. You're going to have to pray more. And I highly encourage you to seek outside help. Find a counselor to help you through those things. And I can help you find one. Thanks, guys. Jeremy? In all these things, I think we're praying that God changes our hearts at every step in our marriages, in our relationships, and even as we go throughout life. Sometimes it just takes being still and contemplating on who God is. We're going to sing this song and still. Let's bow our heads. Jeremy, you can continue to play. Each week we remind ourselves that it's God's grace that gives us peace with Him. And in an effort to keep our relationships as close to Him as possible, we bring to Him each week our failures this week. So think over Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Where have you failed in this week? Perhaps this week your failure was with your spouse. And just silent to yourself in your heart, say, God, I confess this failure to you. I confess that failure to you. The Word of God says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and he is just so that he forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness god we bring our failures to you we bring our delusions to you where we foolishly believe the delusion that we know what's better for us and then we act on it god
God, we are numbskulls, but man, you're amazing. And we thank you for that forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we have some prayer requests to pray about today, and one is going to be close to your heart. Now, she's not in serious condition, but you may have seen this week that Glenn Cox, Donna Cox, and Katie Cox all have COVID. Katie is quarantining out of their house somewhere else, and Donna and Glenn have been in the house, and a friend is taking care of them. Well, the doctors gave them some numbers that if their oxygen levels got to a certain point they wanted them back in for a chest x-ray so Glenn texted me this morning at 10 telling me that he was taking Donna to the hospital for that x-ray because their oxygen levels have gotten close to that point friends no one fights harder than Donna we need to pray today that she will have the strength to fight this and don't you know they're they're probably scared so we want to pray for them Wilder is negative. Uh, he's quarantining away, but we want to pray for them. Continue to pray for Floyd and Ann's health. Kathy Gillen's sister, Debbie and Chris. Kathy is out of town tending to them. Joe Ball's brother who's fighting cancer. And Lucy Calhoun's son. Let's pray. Father, we lift up our family to you. And God, today our hearts are concerned most for our friend Donna Cox. God, she's a fireball, but today she needs your fire in her life. She needs your strength, God. We pray that your Holy Spirit would strengthen the tissues and the systems in her body, that you would raise oxygen levels, that you would dissolve mucus and phlegm. We pray for a miracle, God, and we pray that you would use the doctors to diagnose and treat above their natural ability, that they would be filled by your spirit to treat her. And we pray for Glenn and Katie as they heal. And we, while we're at it, God, we just lift up our world to you. Lord, I saw this week in an email that our mayor has declared a day of prayer and fasting against this virus in October. So we are thankful that our city is at least turning to you. And we pray, God, that you would bring healing. God, we're thankful that Faye is home. We pray for recovery for her. We lift up Floyd and Ann, that you would give them answers to how they're feeling physically. For Chris and Debbie, Kathy's sisters, we pray for healing, God. Their family's gone through so much. We ask you to continue to heal Joe Ball's brother as he fights cancer. And for Lucy's daughter, as she recovers for surgery. God, our world needs you. Our world is broken. Our nation is broken. God, we ask that you would give our leaders wisdom, regardless of their political affiliation or their belief system. We pray you would guide the king. But may the heart of the king be in the hand of the Lord and heal our land. In Jesus' name we pray. stand.
rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Oh, Christ Take out your hand out as we go. Married couples and dating or serious dating couples. You have homework this week. You have homework. I want you to pick a time where you can take 30 minutes together. And I want you to plan ahead and feed each other and do it rested. That may not mean you do it on a weeknight. It may mean a Saturday brunch. Get fed and get rested. And then I want you to pick one of these three topics on the back. Pressures or problems at work that have affected your relationship, or that would be at home, too. Number two, taking care of household responsibilities, such as cleaning, yard work, home repairs, shopping, and so on. Or disagreements about how you spend your leisure time. I want you to take 30 minutes, and I want guys to start by saying, sweet baby doll, how do you feel about this issue? And I want you to listen not interrupt and then ladies I want you to reply stud muffin how do you feel about these issues you don't have to say stud muffin and then when you're done I want you to fill out this now that I know blank 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 about stud muffin I can change and serve sugar baby better by blank 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 now, I did three blanks in some of those because you may want to put a subject, verb, and object of some kind. I can take out the trash more often. It may be real simple that I can fold my clothes and put them on the dresser at night. Start with this. Now, some of you, this may be old hat. Some of you, this may be a challenge. Start building a set of your couple's communication game rules. Have a great week. Love you all.
with ushers as you leave. That'll be great. Thank you. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done Hey, if you stuck around long enough for the end of this video, I just want to thank you again for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. If I could, I just want to take one more second of your time today to ask you and encourage you to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, and also to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. All three of those accounts are under the name Oasis at Conway Gardens. And if I could, I want to encourage you to like videos, comment on them, and even share them to your own social media accounts. Now this is not a way for the church to become more popular and we don't make any money off of likes, comments, or shares. This is just a way for us in a digital age to be able to share the gospel. We wanna get the good news of Jesus Christ and his love for us out to a broken and hurting world and this is one of the best ways that we can do that. So if you could take just a second to go follow our social media accounts, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and maybe the next time you watch one of our videos, hit the like button, comment on it, or share it to your social media accounts if you feel compelled to do so. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for joining us and have a great week.